on the first of September two thousand and five, the president said, I don't think anyone anticipated the breach of the levies. The president's response to Katrina by way of FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security was criminally delayed, indifferent, and inept. The only Federal Emergency Management employee posted in New Orleans in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Marty Bahamande, emailed head of FEMA, Michael Brown, from his BlackBerry device on August 31st, 2005, regarding the conditions. The email was urgent and detailed and indicated the situation is past critical. Estimates are many will die within hours. Brown's reply was emblematic of the administration's entire response to the catastrophe. Thanks for the update. Anything specific I need to do or tweak? The Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff, did not declare an emergency, did not mobilize the federal resources, and seemed to not even know what was happening on the ground until reporters told him. On, Feb on Friday, August 26, 2005, Governor Kathleen Blanco declared a state of emergency in Louisiana, and Governor Haley Barber of Mississippi followed suit the next day. Also on that Saturday, Governor Blanco asked the president to declare a federal state of emergency, and on the 28th of August, 2005, the, the Sunday before the storm hit, Mayor Nagin of New Orleans declared a state of emergency in New Orleans. This shows that local authorities responding to federal warnings knew how bad the destruction was going to be and anticipated being overwhelmed. Failure to act under these circumstances demonstrates gross negligence in all of these actions and decisions. President George W. Bush has acted in a manner contrary to his trust as president and subversive of constitutional government to the prejudice and cause of the cause of law and justice, and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, President George W. Bush, by such conduct, is guilty of an impeachable offense warranting removal from office. Article 32, misleading Congress and the American people systematically undermining efforts to address global climate change. In his conduct while President of the United States, George W. Bush, in violation of his constitutional oath to faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional duty under Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, has both personally and acting through his agents and subordinates, together with the Vice President, ignored the peril to life and property posed by global climate change manipulated scientific information and mishandled protective policy constituting nonfeasance and malfeasance in office, abuse of power, dereliction of duty, and deception of Congress and the American people. President Bush knew the expected effects of climate change and the role of human activities in driving climate change. This knowledge preceded his first presidential term. During his 2000 presidential campaign. He promised to regulate carbon dioxide emissions. Two, in 2001, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a global body of hundreds of the world's foremost experts on climate change, concluded that, quote, most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely due to increases in greenhouse gas concentrations due to human activities, unquote. The third assessment report projected several effects of climate change, such as continued widespread retreat of glaciers and increase in threats to human health, particularly in lower income populations, predominantly within tropical and subtropical countries, and water shortages. Three, the grave threat to national security posed by global climate change was recognized by the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Planning Research Projects Agency in October of 2003, an agency commission report 
explores how such an abrupt climate change scenario could potentially destabilize the geopolitical environment, leading to skirmishes, battles, and even war due to resource constraints such as one, food shortages due to decreases in net global agriculture production, two, decreased availability and quality of fresh water in key regions due to shifted precipitation patterns causing more frequent floods and droughts, three, disrupted access to energy supply due to extensive sea ice and storminess, four, a December 2004 paper in Science revealed 928 studies published in peer-reviewed journals to determine the number providing evidence against the existence of a link between anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide and climate change. Remarkably, none of the papers disagreed with the consensus position. Five, the November 2007 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fourth assessment report showed that global anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases have increased 70 percent between 1970 and 2004. And anthropogenic emissions are very likely the cause of global climate change. The report concluded that global climate change could cause the extinction of 20 to 30 percent of species in unique ecosystems such as the polar areas and biodiversity hotspots, increase extreme weather events, especially in the developing world, and have adverse effects on food production and fresh water availability. The President's done little to address this most serious of problems, thus constituting an abuse of power and criminal neglect. He has also actively endeavored to undermine efforts by the federal government, states, and other nations to take action on their own. In March 2001, President Bush announced the U.S. would not be pursuing ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, an international effort to reduce greenhouse gases. The United States is the only industrialized nation that has failed to ratify the accord. In March of 2008, Representative Henry Waxman wrote to EPA, EPA administer, Administrator Stephen Johnson, quote, in August 2003, the Bush administration denied a petition to regulate CO2 emissions from motor vehicles by deciding that CO2 was not a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. In April 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court overruled that determination in Massachusetts versus the EPA. The Supreme Court wrote that if EPA makes a finding of endangerment, the Clean Air Act requires the agency to regulate emissions of the deleterious pollutant from new motor vehicles. The EPA then conducted an extensive investigation involving 60 to 70 staff who concluded that CO2 emissions endanger both human health and welfare. These findings were submitted to the White House after which uh, work on the findings and the required regulations was halted. End of quote from Mr. Waxman. Three. A memo to members of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on May 19, 2008 stated, quote, the record before the committee shows, one, the career staff at EPA unanimously supporting granting California's petition to be allowed to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from cars and trucks consistent with California law. Two, Stephen Johnson, the administrator of EPA, also supported granting California's petition, at least in part, and three, Administrator Johnson reversed his position after communications with officials in the White House. The President has suppressed the release of scientific information relating to global climate change, an action which undermines Congress's ability to legislate and provide oversight, and has thwarted efforts to prevent global climate change despite the serious threat that it poses. One. February 2001, ExxonMobil wrote a memo to the White House outlining ways to influence the outcome of third assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The memo opposed the re-election of Dr. Robert Watson as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change chairman. The White House then supported an opposition candidate who was subsequently elected to replace Dr. Watson.